Welcome to The Developmental, a podcast about the messy, beautiful ways grown-ups grow up. Here, we explore turning the science into the day-to-day practice of adult development in teams, homes, organizations, and life. Hello, my friends, and welcome to a new episode of The Developmental, one that I am very excited about. To be frank, I'm excited about each of them uh, because I only invite people that I like and admire and I'm looking forward learning things from. So I've done it again this time. But the topic of today is uh, a bit of a different topic and its intersection to adult development has hardly ever been explored. So I'm very, very excited to invite you into this whole new territory of neurodivergence and giftedness in adults. And I have an amazing dialogue partner for this, Tracy Winter, who is a self-confessed fellow nerd. We both love this word for uh, our own reasons, and you'll find out as you listen to the episode why. Tracy uh, has an extraordinarily interesting background. Uh, She is a gifted adult herself and a neurodivergent adult. Um, She has done many things in life from uh, being a legislative analyst to a tap dancer, a junk professor. She has a PhD in human development, having studied gifted adults and is an International Coaching Federation uh, certified coach, working exclusively with gifted and neurodivergent adults today. So Tracy has a wealth of lived experience of what neurodivergence is, what life as a neurodivergent person feels like, what the gifts of it are, what the challenges of it are. And also she has a deep passion for human development that we both share. So I hope that our conversation, which goes from exploring uh, the topic from an academic perspective to very personal stories, will um, bring you on a journey and get you reflecting on the neurodivergent people in your own life, or perhaps even on yourself if you identify as a neurodivergent person. So without further ado, here's Tracy and our nerdy conversation, which I hope you enjoy. Hello, Tracy. So good to see you and so good to do this together. Okay, we are going to have to edit. I just realized, I don't know if I pronounced your name Alice or Elise, because I've heard it both ways on your show. Both. Both are um, both are good. It doesn't what matter. What do you prefer? Well, Alice is Romanian pronunciation. Alice is okay. where right. Alice I'm sorry came to make from. You start over all- <laughs> I'm sorry to make you start over right away, but all of a sudden I was like... No, 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 that's all good. We'll start over. Hey, we could actually not not like not cut this out. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that is so telling of our dynamic. <laughs> this is absolutely true. This is exactly who we are, right? Yes. Do you mind if we leave it in? Uh, no, not at all. Cool. That's terrific. <laughs> so folks, this is how Tracy and I rock and roll. This is um <laughs> I think the first time we connected was I felt like this is a person I can nerd out with. And I was saying before we started this recording um, that um, I love that you chose the word nerd, you know, to describe your business, because that's something that I've somehow made part of my identity. So when people ask me for a very short introduction of me, I, I always start by saying that I'm a nerd. So I think this definitely is a conversation between two nerds. Even nerding out Absolutely. on the right pronunciation <laughs> of a name. And names are important, right? Like that's they the are. beginning of identity. So I find it important. But yes, my practice nerd coach is. Um, and then when I when I checked out the Vertical Development Institute, I started nerding out over over your work and vertical development and just sort of became a fangirl. I was like, this is amazing. So yes, we'll nerd out together and it'll be yeah. delightful. And the other way around. And also, I'll also say something that I shared before we started this recording, that in the last couple of weeks or so, I've had multiple people ask me about neurodivergence 
um, at, in the context of work or in the context of grown up relationships and how does that work and how do how does strengths work and positive psychology work in relation to neurodivergence um, and then vertical development in relation to neurodivergence. So there's a really beautiful big playing field for us to explore together. But I think all stories start uh, with the beginning and there are roots for our work in our early life. Um, it, it is the case definitely with me and I know it's the case with you. So I'd love to ask you, Tracy, you know, how did you come to work and coach neurodivergent grownups? How did you, yeah, what was your story and your path that led you to this? My origin story? Well, your yes. origin story. Thank you for asking. So, um, so let me real quick just define neurodivergent. Right. Yes. So people who are neurodivergent um, are people who have a brain pattern, my brain type that is significantly different from the norm. Mm -hmm. So in practical terms, that usually means people who are ADHDers, autistic people, gifted people, dyslexic, dyspraxic, dyscalculic. I think that's a word. Um, also TBI, PTSD, anything that, that creates a different brain structure. Mm -hmm. Right. So having said that, so I was um, identified as a gifted kid um, when I was very young. I think I was formally tested when I was four. So that's always been sort of a part of my understanding of myself. My sister was then identified. My mom got her graduate degree in gifted education and created and, and, and did a program for 20 years. My dad is highly gifted. So it's all in the family, really. Um, so that's just always been a part of my understanding of my existence growing up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm what we also call twice exceptional. So that means gifted and um, usually gifted and one of those other things that other people may call a disability. So I am gifted and ADHD -er, um, which makes for a super special combination. My dad is too. My sister is too. My nephew is too. So very hereditary and again, surrounding me. Um, but I didn't find that until much later. So I was your typical gifted. So girl, you knew the gifted you know, part. You didn't know the other part. The ADHD right. spot. Mm -hmm. Right. Which happens to a lot of gifted kids, especially gifted girls, because we, be, we become pleasers and we want to achieve a lot of the time. So, but our giftedness overshadows whatever the other exceptionality might be. And so that doesn't get served or it's vice versa. Um, for me, I didn't find out I was an ADHD -er until I hit my literature review in my doctoral program. Until then, like, you know, I'd been able to basically make it through, I guess, on my smarts. But mm -hmm. this hit and I couldn't get through an academic article. Like I would read the same page for an hour and not know what it said still. And it was pretty nutty. And so, um, you know, I talked to a psychiatrist um, on, on, on a recommendation and he watched, he actually watched me read and watched my eyes skipping all over the page and asked me a few more questions like, oh no, I've never done a paper, you know, more than the night before it's due. Why would I do that? Um, things like that. No, I can't make it on time to anything. I think I was two minutes late signing in here. Like that's pretty on time for me. A few things like that. Tried some meds. Yeah, it turns out those work. So probably I'm an ADHD -er. and my dad very clearly was diagnosed. It's very hereditary. So, mm. so that, but I didn't know that until I was in like my mid thirties. Um, and it's, it's become part of my, like, my understanding of my lens and what I can and can't do and what my brain has strengths in and what my brain doesn't have strengths in. So that's, that's where I started coming. And I went to um, graduate school. I thought I was going to graduate school for organizational psychology, basically organizational development. And I found myself in my core coursework, which was shared with the human development school. But I wrote all my papers on like individual things, not on organizational things. And I was like, oh no, I think I'm in the human development side. Uh -huh. I was like, I don't, I don't like person. Like, I don't really like people. I'm supposed to be a computer engineer by personality type. Like, nope, nope. And it was gifted adults that I kept coming back to. Um, and that's mm. really the population that I care about. Um, you know, it's, it's all my friends. It's who I grew up around. It's my family. Um, and that's what I wrote my dissertation about was the social emotional development of highly gifted adults. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, starting my coaching practice, it turns out Gifted adults do not identify as gifted adults. I was trying to start a practice for gifted adults, but I hope you don't mind me sharing. Like, so when we came in earlier today, you said, yeah, I'm a former gifted kid. And I said, yeah, you know what? That makes you as an adult. You said, yeah, I, I don't really call it calling myself that. Yeah. So nobody wants to come to a coaching practice for gifted adults because they don't want to claim the term. 
as soon as I started calling it neurodivergence and started serving ADHDers and autistic folks and everybody else, the clients started coming in. Yeah. And now I think because of like what's out there and who's out there, I'm getting, I'm getting the people who are gifted adults who don't claim it, but are also twice exceptional. So they come, but I'm getting, I'm getting the people who are very bright, who are the most outliery. Um, and that's problem with interviewing an ADHD -er is sometimes we don't remember the question and we kind of wander around. So feel no, free to pull me in. You've answered the question perfectly. It was all about, you know, what brought you here. So, uh, mm -hmm. that Thank was you. so spot on. And I, I actually wanted to ask you because when I read, when I started to read your dissertation, uh, which is about the experience of feeling seen or misseen or unseen, which I, I would love you to tell us a bit more about in a, a bit later in this conversation. Sure. I had this visceral, emotional experience because it took me right back to, you know, my own early years um i was never by the way formally assessed because there was no such thing in communist romania where i grew up so i just knew you know that i was a bit different from the people around me but never actually you know measured that in any formal way um other than you know academic grades and stuff like that um but i was curious what what why do you believe we don't or or gifted adults or even neurodivergent adults, because I, I know a lot of people, ex extremely bright people, very creative thinkers that I work with in my own work and whom I intuit to be neurodivergent, who rarely, if ever, own it or talk about it. Or So there seems to be a bit of, um, I don't know if stigma is the right word or taboo or what? what is it? What would you say it is that prevents us from, because people would talk about their kids. Um, you know, I've got a, my son has ADHD and we're working on that. Or I have a gifted kids. Actually, yes, I've noticed that in parents with gifted kids too. I, I don't talk about my, my own kids giftedness mm -hmm. either. Uh, so that'll be an interesting one too, to explore why. But yeah, I'd be curious. What do you think is the hold up? Yeah. So I think it's a multi branch answer. There's, there's yeah. a lot of reasons. Um, it's funny you say the thing about gifted kids, because I used to, when I was in my graduate program, we'd be in a cohort and talking about our dissertations and I'd say what mine was about and the whole room would get a little tense, except that on the break, everybody would come over and talk to me about their kids, but you're not gifted. Just your kids are. Okay, sure. Um, so that's always fun for me, but I think that, I think I'll start with all of those terms are very loaded and don't actually describe what's going on. So gifted implies that you have something extra, that you have something better, that you like got something with a bow on it. Um, and it's true that there are, you know, different capabilities that come with what we what we determine as gifted. And also there's some social emotional stuff that comes. There's some sensory stuff that comes. There's a whole lot of other dimensions that yeah. make it more difficult to be in the world. And that part we don't talk about, right? So with, and with an ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we do not have a deficit of attention. When we find something interesting, we can focus like anybody, like hyper-focus like crazy. And for eight hours, we will have no idea what's going around us because our attention is fully focused. But we also will have no idea what's going around us. So we don't have a lot of um, agency naturally over our attention. We have to mm -hmm. put some, some structures in place and some things to do that. And hyperactivity, there are, there are, in the DSM anyway, now there are three kinds of, of ADHD. There's ADHD hyperactive type, there's ADHD in, inattentive type, and there's ADHD combined type. So there's plenty of people, especially bright women who are inattentive type and who they never got diagnosed because the stigma and the stereotype of an ADHD person is an eight-year-old boy running around a classroom making, pro making problems. Yeah. The dreamy girl, you know, sitting there and her brain is totally somewhere else also an ADHD or doesn't look like that, right? So there are these like stereotypes of these folks, you know, with, with um, autistic people, we, we think of the kids who are nonverbal. We think of, um, you know, some of the sensory issues that, you know, result in meltdown and overwhelm. And that's not always what it looks like. So I think there's a stigma attached to how it has been described in the past. And we are getting more and more understanding of the, 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 the array of what it can look like. Autistic, I think also 
translates or is from, from one of the ancient languages of self-involved, which is absolutely not true of autistic mm -hmm. people. Like sometimes they have an overage of empathy, which is why they don't look like they have it because they have to sort of block and shut down it's too much. It gets, it, they yeah. feel too much. They can feel too much. Yeah. yeah. And there's mm. something called the double empathy problem where like my kind of empathy isn't like your kind of empathy. And that's where we, you know, autistic people often who are together do just fine with communication and empathy and same thing with neurotypical people, but you put the two together and you just have a mismatch of, of communication. So mm. back to your question about stigma and why don't we claim these things? The other thing is that we think they're normal. Like many of these things are hereditary. So you grew up in a family and everybody's like that. You think that's how everybody is, right? Yep. Um, so you don't necessarily notice a difference. Um, yep. People, especially adults, are getting diagnosed with ADHD, autism, when their kids at school are getting recommended for evaluation. And they go in and they talk to the you know, evaluator and the diagnostician. And they're listening about their kid and they're like, well, yeah, that's that's what people do, right? That's normal. And the, usually the diagnostician is, why don't you make an appointment for you to come back in on your own and we'll talk about your situation. And that's how a lot of adults get get diagnosed. So um, mm -hmm. there's there are several barriers, you know, there's there's more than a few barriers to this. Um, most of the neurodivergences are, are currently, at least in the United States, um, classified as disabilities, um, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, those all are covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So like, there's a way that that is, um, it's almost implied, you don't want to be disabled, less than yes. something less than Absolutely. what you're supposed to be. Mm. Yes. Mm. And who would want to claim that? Right? Yes. Yeah. So it's and a whole mishmash of different the pieces. Yeah, thank you. And I, I do think part part of I think what drew us together and we found it so fascinating uh, this intersection between your field of working with neurodivergence and my passion for the lifelong development of human beings is mm -hmm. that I think we both agree that this this developmental um, journey can look and feel in many many different ways um mm -hmm. and quite often in organizations when people start to talk about vertical development and it's become quite a hot interesting topic nowadays the motivation behind is we want people uh, operating from the later stages of development because their capacity to deal with complexity grows their ability to co-create new creative ideas out of you know when there's no mm -hmm. previous path or previous right answer develops mm -hmm. and so forth but I think to have that conversation without accounting for the beautiful diversity that comes from the inherent neurodivergence we carry in, in mm -hmm. us as human beings is just limiting it's almost assuming there's a normal way to grow up um, and there's a standard in which you um, you know you have to yes. fit in in a sense so uh, to give a concrete example when I started to uh, do the lit review for my own PhD I was coming across all of these um, pieces of data around, you know, an adult can't be um, at, let's say, redefining stage earlier than this age. So there was this assumption that there is a link between age and, um, you know, developmental mm -hmm. stage. Holding two opposing ideas in your brain at the same time is, you know, cognitive maturity comes at later than whatever age. And mm -hmm. that was not my lived experience. I'm raising a seven-year-old who talks to me about people have light and dark in them. And I can see, you know, the beauty of my friend. And I can see how annoying she can be at the same time. And I hold both of these in my mind. And she's seven. And I, I remember similar experiences from my own childhood. So something at times I felt didn't really fit in this linear idea of development. So I think if we bring the two together, we account for neurodivergence mm -hmm. um, as we talk about vertical development, a more colorful, maybe complete picture can emerge. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because um, the, the diff def there's lots of definitions of giftedness out there. Um, it's one of the challenges in the field, but the one that most psychologist types use starts with giftedness is asynchronous development. Yes. And it goes on to, to be more detailed, right? So it's developing at much different rates. And I actually wrote a paper in school talking about how stage theory might not apply for outliers, particularly for gifted people, because a couple of things. Number one, you've got this asynchronous development. So when you're 
when you're um, you know creating stage theory, what you have to do is sort of hold everything constant except the thing that you're solving for, right? So we have emotional maturity, we have cognitive maturity, we have all these things. But they're actually like developing at about the same rate in most people. Whereas with an asynchronous development, like if you have lower emotional maturity than you have cognitive maturity, how can those stages possibly look the same at age whatever, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing is because my populations are outliers, stage theory is based on like when it's being created is, is based on surveys and research over a huge number of people because we want to talk about here's what it is for everybody. Well, outliers either get tossed out or rolled in to no effect. So I'm not convinced that the stage theories actually represent our experience. You said, you know, there's stuff that didn't, didn't sort of resonate with you. Yep. Possibly because it's not reflecting your experience, even though it reflects the experience of many, many people around the world. So, but that's what we've got to work with. So, okay, we'll play with these stage theories, right? Just building on that, because I think that's a great point Mm -hmm. you're making. And I think you are the, one of the few people that I've heard outside of my field talking about the asynchronous um, development. Mm -hmm. This is something that has, uh, although I haven't really ever focused in my own work on neurodivergence per se, but it's something that has kind of popped in or up from coaching conversations where, uh, you know, people will take a sentence completion test and they will get um, a gravity center, let's say, uh, an mm-hmm. octave of development, as I call them, because I love this piano metaphor or stage mm-hmm. of development that seems to be the stage that they mostly operate fr- from. But then when we actually look in the coaching process at what comprises that stage, this is the word that I came up with as well, asynchronicity, because there seem to be these lines of development, cognitive being one, emotional being another, but there are others like people's relationship to time, people's relationship to power, people's relationship to rules, self-awareness, uh, motivation. So if you start as a coach to look and double click on the stage and start to look at the lines underneath, even if the client may not be neurodivergent, you still find asynchronicity to a mm-hmm. quite a big degree as I'm noticing uh the more I look into it which I think is really mm-hmm. interesting because then it almost invites us to not think of stages as these solid blocks of you know you're here in all aspects mm-hmm. of your development but actually you might be a bit further along in some ways and you might be a bit mm-hmm. behind in other ways so I wonder if you know in the work with neurodivergence you'll almost see this to a much greater extent but then we can get some wisdom from that in the way we work with everyone stop assuming mm-hmm. that if somebody's a super complex thinker they'll automatically be a mature um mature in their social mm-hmm. interactions Absolutely. yeah and, and it's you know you brought in the coaching piece and I have done presentations on neurodivergence for um, specifically for coaches. And one of the things I say is coaching, like if you go back to the heart of coaching, where we take each individual as an individual who is creative, resourceful, and whole, and we are not bringing any assumptions in, we don't bring all the ways that we've treated all of our other clients in, we are, you know, it's a bespoke thing for this client. That is, that is what I do with all of my clients. That's what they have to have because they have these asynchronicities, right? So like a couple of things you mentioned are motivation, time awareness. So that immediately dings my bells on ADHD, right? I was just talking about earlier, like my awareness of time is, I'm time blind most of the time. Um, I have to, like, I have a little time timer here. That's how I get through my sessions and try to pace them decently. Um, Motivation for ADHDers, we have a lower distribution of dopamine in our brains, which is the motivation neurotransmitter basically, right? So like we are often not motivated by priority or, you know, we are motivated by disappointing other people. We are motivated by um, our values. We're motivated by, um, as as a colleague of mine says, lo- looming, it's not apocalypse, looming disaster. I love that phrase. Like, right? But these are not sort of mature motivations as you would, you know, like you wouldn't think of this as mature motivations. You'd think of motivation as intrinsic, Mm -hmm. you know, at a mature level, right? Yep. Our brain chemistry does not support intrinsic motivation. So what do you do with that? Right? Like how does, what does that development look like then? So it's, yeah, those are all interesting questions, I think, Mm. which is why it's fun talking to you. 
I love it. I, I and I, I will throw in the question that I I had. I promised a participant just the other day that I would <laughs> bring into this conversation with you because I think it's topical. Um, I did this workshop on strengths and positive psychology, mm. and we were challenging this idea that in in our upbringing, quite often the focus has been on what we what is lacking, um, mm-hmm. and what we you know we should get better at versus what are our qualities that we can actually um, utilize more and more purposefully. So, and this participant asked me, how does this whole theory of strengths apply to people with ADHD or neurodivergent people? And Mm -hmm. you're almost now saying, look, if you know that you're working with a neurodivergent client, let's say it's a client with ADHD, you might expect their time, their line of relationship to time in their development Mm -hmm. to just be, they would be playing at an earlier stage than many other things that they can do at a much later stage. So how Mm -hmm. do you apply this strength theory? Because you said that positive psychology lies at the core of the approach you take in your coaching. So I'd be, yeah, Mm -hmm. I'd love us to learn a bit more about how you see that yeah. in your Well, work. so, you know, as you know, coaching really has, has a lot of basis in positive psychology and strength, right? Yes, like absolutely. We look at what the person can do much more than what the person can't do. Um, and, I, and just like I said about coaching in general, it's doubly true, I think, for my population that I'm interested in. Um, these folks, and this gets into my dissertation a little bit, but these are folks who are statistically outside the norm. Yep. And they don't get things done in the same way other people do them, but they think they're supposed to. Um, I think it's Ed Hallowell who says, you know, it's like being given, you know, everybody else gets gets a bit uh, a bicycle and we're given a skateboard with a manual of how to use a bicycle. Like that's never going to work out. But that's what we're told. Like, why can't you just use a planner for an ADHD or or why can't you just, you know, calm down for an autistic person who might be on sensory meltdown? those kinds of things, right? So the reflections that we get from the time we are kids, I mean, little kids is you're doing it wrong. You are wrong. Like your very being is wrong and you can't do anything right. You know, Um, just, just by very, like, just by existing. So the amount of shame and the amount of sort of like psychic buildup of that weight for my clients is stronger than I find for the neurotypical clients that I've worked with. I don't, we don't have to work as hard. You know, when, when I say, what are your strengths? My neurotypical clients have an easier time answering that question. My ADHD clients who've just spent 15 minutes in a discovery call telling me all the ways that they are deficient, sit there in silence for like 90 seconds and come up with maybe two things, right? Because that's not what we're taught. So it's even more important to me to be like, okay, look what your brain does do well. What has worked? You know, let's experiment with that because they also won't believe it's going to work, right? Because they tried everything everybody said. So, so what would work? What's what is specific to you? And this is where the individuality piece of it comes in. This is you've got a unique brain. You're going to have a unique solution. You're going to have a unique path to get there. Let's figure that out together. But it is all based on what are the strengths that we can harness? What are the, you know, and one of those actually is for, for a lot of neurodivergent people is problem solving because, because they've gotten these reflections their whole lives, they've had to problem solve like unconsciously forever. So I point that out. Like you haven't, you are, your problem solving is a strength. So let's apply that to these things that you see as problems, but we just need to figure out how to work with your brain to get you where you want to go. Yeah. So the strengths, how do people receive this when you offer this? Because it sounds like such a powerful reframe instead of you know you've got a problem and here are some common solutions to this problem you're actually saying you don't have a problem you're just functioning in a different way and you have Mm -hmm. this capacity exceptional capacity uh perhaps to problem solve so then why not bring this strength to figuring out ways to make your own life easier without expecting the recipe to come from the outside and what's how is this received by people when you offer this well, I have to calibrate it carefully depending on what the client, what I perceive the client is ready to hear, right? Um, but I get a lot of, um, even just in the first 30 minute call, relief mm-hmm. of, oh, the reason nothing's worked is because none of those things were meant to work for me. They were never going to work for me. Okay. Somebody's saying I have a brain that is different from everybody else. That's how I felt my whole life. So let's do this. Like some of them, I have had people 
like crying at the end of 20 minutes because it's the first time they have felt like somebody saw them for the, the ways they can be and who they can be and what, like what light they bring. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm always both like honored and sad when that happens. Yeah. Right. Cause like, oh my gosh, you're not getting this anywhere. So it can be a uh, very jarring and yeah. it can also be a validation. So it just sort of depends on, you know, meet your client where they are. Right. Yeah. Depends absolutely. on where they are, but there's a oh. lot of relief. There's a lot of like, oh, wait a second. You get it like that in their eyes. Um, mm -hmm. Then those are, those are the people who become my clients. Yeah. And you did, you did say the word seen. Um, and I know this has been, <laughs> this has been the cornerstone um, of your research. Um, yes. And I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about, you know, what, what your research was about um, and, and what you found around this experience of feeling seen or not feeling seen in life. Which, by the way, when I read it, I thought, I, I believe this is such a powerful concept to reflect on in the human experience as a whole. Mm -hmm. I know you focused on your divergence in your own research, and it perhaps is way more poignant when, when you feel like you're different and you're not being seen and what mm -hmm. the impact of that is. So, yeah, I'd love to, to hear a bit more about that if you'd like to share. Well, ask somebody to talk about their dissertation. They're going to talk for hours. So you have to cut me off. We know that, right? We're relatively recent doctorals. Um, yeah. So my my dissertation was actually entitled "Being Seen" with a capital S, um, self concept development in highly gifted adults. So what I was looking at was self concept is formed by our understanding of the reflections that we're getting from other people, and what the self concept theorist says is this is what makes up who you are. Now, I took issue with some of that in my literature review because I think there's identity. There's like an innate sense of who you are. And so when you get reflections of who you are that don't match your innate sense of who you are, that is like massive cognitive dissonance, right? Um, and the people who are outliers in, in this particular research case, highly gifted, but I suspect it's true for other outliers. There aren't that many people who are similar enough to them to give them that reflection. So the metaphor I use is like, what they've been getting all their lives are funhouse mirror reflections, right? Most people are holding up a mirror that isn't giving them a true reflection. It's giving them this warped kind of version of themselves, which is the shame, which is the guilt, which is why am I so weird, right? And then when you get someone who comes along and holds up a flat mirror, says, this is who you are. This is who I see you as. This is how I believe you to be. And it matches, like I'm gonna get, I'm getting worked up and it matches who you believe yourself to be, it is, as one of my students that said, it's, it's like suddenly standing in the sun, like the sky's open and the sun shines down and you're standing in that sunbeam. But the rest of the time it's been overcast. So can I, uh, I, uh, oh, yeah. sorry. I just want to interject just for a moment to share an example of a moment like Please. that, because it came to me um, when I started to read your research. So um, as a as a kid, I was academically very good. <laughs> let's say that was my thing. Yep. Uh, and I was treated like a, a brain by my family, by my pe peers, teachers. Uh, peers didn't care that much. But socially, speaking of lines of development, I caught up with my social line of development later. Um, mm -hmm. I was not a good colleague. I was bullying other kids. I felt like I couldn't make friends. I didn't know how to do it. So I put all of my energy in being like the straight A kid, best in class, loved by the teachers, hated by the colleagues. And when I was 12, oh, and uh, I'm just adding one more detail to that. In my family, there was a lot of emphasis on intellectual excellence and praise for that. Not much attention given to emotional emotions or speaking about emotions mm -hmm. and any expression of extreme emotion, especially if it was a negative. So anger, like sadness, we didn't go there. So I had no idea what to do with my emotions. So when I was 12, mm -hmm. there came this um, pivotal point where I was so aggressive towards the kids in my class that a paradoxical situation uh, ensued where I was a top of class academically, but the problem kid behaviorally. Mm -hmm. And in Romania, where I grew up, we had in the school system, I think it's still um, present, this idea of the good behavior mark. So if you did not get 
the tick for good behavior, you couldn't get the top prize at the end of the year, you would be publicly shamed. So it would be the ultimate shame for the straight A kid to have that tick removed mm -hmm. for good behavior. So I went through this moment in my 12 year old life where the head teacher said, look, Alice's behavior is just getting out of hand. And I would like us to vote as a class on whether to, uh, you know, um, lower her behavior mark grade, whatever you call it. So I can see remember. me, but I'm aghast. I'm totally yes. aghast and it's showing all <laughs> over my face. shock on your face. Oh um, my goodness. So I'm standing up in front of this, you know, in surrounded by 30 peers and the teacher is at the, if, uh, at the, what do you call it? The desk in front of the uh -huh. class and I'm waiting the vote. And I'm, I'm convinced that this is their chance to get their revenge for, you know, all of the fighting and all of the angry outbursts and all of the stuff that I was conscious I was doing, but I just felt, you know, I'm defending myself. These kids are teasing me for being a nerd. You know, I'm punching them because by the way, I'm pretty tall and pretty strong still. I can, I can do this. So I was so convinced that they were going to vote. Um, yes, absolutely. Let's punish her. And actually they didn't. They voted no. We're going to, we're not going to lower Alice's um, grade for good behavior. Which came as a shock for me then. I don't have any rational explanation for it to this day, other than that my colleagues were probably way more empathic and, you know, um, emotionally aware than I was. So for me, that was a moment of feeling seen in the sense that I felt they saw my humanity and they didn't believe I was a bad person. So then it occurred to me, and speaking of vertical development, there's this transition between opportunist and diplomat in the early stages mm -hmm. where you shift from, it's all about me, I can't really even imagine what other people are feeling, to diplomat where I want to belong, I care about other people, I want to be part of a community. I think that was the day and the moment when my brain popped open and made that shift. But it came from a moment of being forgiven on the one hand, but also seen on the other as more than the annoying nerd. So I think when you when you talk about self-concept shifting in moments of being seen, that for mm -hmm. me was, it put me on the path really of what I'm doing now, because I started to wonder, oh, how does the mind work? How can I be a better person? What does, you know, being wise or empathic even mean? Um, anyway, it opened up a whole universe. But that's beautiful. And also, I'm so impressed by the 12, like, that's not what I expect from 12 year olds, period. So like, that's gorgeous. Um, it's also, I talk about this a little bit in my dissertation, this, this sort of slightly different version of being seen where you don't get reflected how you are, but somebody actually sees like how you could be the next level. Uh -huh. And you get that reflection. And it's like, really, you see me that way? I could, and I, and I, it has to be somebody for me, it has to be somebody I respect and I think they know what they're talking about. And, you know, like, and, but then it's like, oh my gosh, now it's possibility for me. And in my dissertation slides, I had one of um, a little cat sitting in front of a big mirror that was reflecting a lion. Right. So like, it's that, that kind of mirror. Like I, you see you as a cat, I see you as a lion. And then you grow into being a lion. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like, they saw you for what you could be too which is cool. Yeah, definitely. I didn't think, I, I don't think I was the person they saw in me when they, you know, chose not to take their revenge. Definitely. But I really strive to become that person or more of that person as the years went by. So how does that, you know, um, I know you talk about, and also I'd love us to explore this positive disintegration kind of moment. I wonder if that played a role as well. In the vertical development research, we talk about um, disorienting dilemmas, the moments when Something in your worldview is so deeply disturbed that it does just reality does not make sense through the filters that you used to use. Mm -hmm. um, and you you have to grow into some sort of larger perspective because this disorienting mm -hmm. dilemma breaks open your old worldview. And you use the term positive disintegration, if I'm not mistaken. So Correct. what mm -hmm. what is the role of positive disintegration in, in your work? So the, so the gifted psychological research world really is, is the world that uses Dabrowski. And we're trying to expand past that. Um, but that's what it has been since it was introduced to the gifted world in, I think, 1979 by Michael Piachowski. 
Um, and Dorowski was a psychiatrist and a psychologist who created this theory of what he called personality development. Um, and he has five levels. He doesn't call them stages because stages assume that you develop into them, right? So he's got levels. And most people never go above level one and two, according to Dabrowski. Level one is sort of like going with the flow. You know, you take on the, the values and the, you know, what, what your community thinks. And those are, that's what you grow up believing. And that's what you keep believing and like status quo, right? And that's sort of what he said was most people. Level two is starting to question that a little bit. Um, it's called unilevel disintegration. So like, I'm kind of uncomfortable here, but I'm not really sure about that. And from level two, you could either, most people drop back into level one and get, kind of get comfy again, because it's just uncomfortable in that potential growth area. Some people who have a bunch of, there's criteria that he talks about, um, go into level three. And level three to me aligns with what you talk about, it, what you know this literature talks about as disorienting dilemma. Level three is, oh my goodness, I suddenly see the difference between who I am and like who I want to be, what I could ideally be. I also see that in the world. Like here's like, that's what the world, and it creates this existential angst and anxiety and depression and disappointment in yourself and shame in yourself and embarrassment in yourself. And it, that can be a place where people get stuck is, is in there and don't get reoriented. The people who do develop out of that Level four is I'm living level four and then level five, although that's really rare, is um, I'm living a life in line with my values. I am actually walking my talk and not in a small way, not in pockets. My whole life is aligned. And, you know, there's different gradations of all of that. Um, but that I think is aligned with and, and Dabrowski talked about you have one positive disintegration period. The people I talk to you now and the research that researchers that have come along since then, we talk about positive disintegrations. Like I'm going through one. Okay, so we know what that's about. And yeah. it might be around a particular thing, like existential loneliness. It was my most recent one. Like, oh my goodness, leaning mm -hmm. into that abyss. I've had other ones. Um, and so it's reorienting, like you said, on a different level, right? You can't go back to the way, like once you can't unsee it. So you must grow. Or you just get stuck in this sort of misery place, which people do. Um, but I think it is aligned in that growth way of like the whole world falls apart at your feet there, or there is no ground under your feet and you have to make it right. Yeah. And that sort of, is that, that aligns with disorienting development, don't, doesn't it? You're yeah, the expert on that piece. It's such a, such a, um, yeah, I feel it's so congruent with, with the way mm -hmm. vertical development works um and it sounds mm -hmm. like it's there's a subject object shift that happens as well where you're absolutely able to see yourself in a different way and linking it back to your own research i'm curious whether you know this experience of feeling seen versus not feeling mm -hmm. seen does it support this this growth um people experience in question. any way or can it hinder it it's a great question i think I didn't study this. So you're getting my hot take right now. Um, I think being seen can only help your development, can only move it along. Because if you don't know who you are in the first place, how do you compare that to an ideal self? Or how do you compare that to like what it could be, right? If you're so unsure because who the reflection you're getting doesn't match who I believe myself to be, that sense of self is fuzzy. You know, if you if you try to make that that subjective into object and move to subject, like what are you even looking at? Mm -hmm. So I think you have to solidify, right? That piece first before you can let it fall apart. Yeah, expand into something new. Yeah, and I think being seen is one of the things that helps do that. Um, and then and then too, being seen, um, you know, my coach right now is the Dabrowski theorist you know she she's also an agile coach she's amazing she's so wise her name is kate arms she's amazing shout out i'll and put that in the note for sure thank you too um but she sees me in that cat lion way right and so that makes me believe that i can develop even further that mm -hmm. makes me see what could be it's like the peak over the fence right that you then develop into um so i think it's I think it can be key. Is it necessary? I don't know that one. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
like, I want to say yes, because I feel being seen is so important, but I don't want to say that without having done some real work on it. Yep. What have you found? What do you know from your data about this experience of being seen? And what what are the when you're not seen, what is that like for people? And what is the impact of that? You know, it's it's funny because I started out doing this dissertation wanting to write about the positive. I wanted to write about the experiences of being seen and sort of like define that and what that looked like. And I sort of couldn't because all the data that my my participants gave me was largely on the this seen or not seen side, which are either somebody reflects to you that fun house mirror, right? So, so the way you understand yourself is not how other people understand you. That's or missing. you're just ignored. That's misseen. Or you're not seen, which means like you just sort of blend into the woodwork and people just move past you without even, without even noticing or seeing you, which can be a defense, honestly, against mm-hmm. being misseen. So, so what was the question? See, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was I was asking what you've learned. I just want to clarify a point. So mm-hmm. when people when the difference between misseen and unseen, misseen could be when you're, for example, in the context of work, you're regarded as, you know, this technical expert, and that's all people see about you, but they might not see, I don't know, that you're actually also a sensitive person or that you need other things in the relationship other than just that, you know, maybe quality that you bring, or is mm-hmm. it more complicated than that? It's, it is often, it's some that, but it's often a step further. That's, that's more of the not seeing because they're not seeing a part of you, but they uh-huh. are seeing this thing that is a part of you. They're seeing this one little part of your window, right? Missing is, oh, you think you're so much better than us because of this intellect. Oh, they're right. aloof. Oh, they, you know, whatever. Like, why should we listen to them? They're always head in the clouds, right? As opposed to Maybe there's a communication barrier here and they have some interesting ideas that we should communi- you know, communicate around or things like that. It's that misinterpretation, assumption and misinterpretation of behavior that they see. Right. That is not the intent, which you know can't really be telegraphed easily, of the person doing the behavior and often, often not even aware that's what we're telegraphing. That's the what- number of times, like you can see me, I am not a large person. I was small for my age growing up and I skipped a grade. So I was always very little. I've been called intimidating my whole life. And I just look at myself and go, do you see me? Like, what, how is that? I never, it's it's not how I see myself, but that's what I've been called. That's missing, yep. right? Yeah, yeah. So what did you learn? What did you learn about the impact it has on people to either be seen or feel misseen or unseen? How does it yeah. impact? So the, the former is incredibly difficult, like incredibly important for maybe for development, for mental health, for feeling good about yourself, for developing into what you could be. You know, like we talk about, do you live up to your potential, which is a whole loaded, that's another podcast. And <laughs> like you get, if somebody sees your potential and reflects it to you, you're more likely to develop into it. Right. So like it affects all kinds of things that way. Um, being. So that's how being seen is. Being misseen creates all kinds of confusion, trauma, psychic baggage, like, right? Because, and this is why I do what I do, like in the idealism world that I occasionally pop my head into. Because all of these, these misscenes when we're young and these, you know, you're doing it wrong, you're being it wrong when we're young, that are happening to our brightest people, right? And our most creative thinkers. So now they're stuck spending energy on imposter syndrome, on, you know, how do I do, what do I do in this social situation, learning these scripts, beating myself up for not being able to, you know, get my files in order, even though I can, you know, create a brand new way of doing the internet, whatever. Like, imagine if they weren't spending that energy on all of that junk that's accumulated. Mm-hmm. What could we be creating, right? Like these are the people who are going to cure cancer. They're going to like yeah. figure out, world hunger and peace in the Middle East. And we're holding them back with all of this junk. So like yeah. now I'll have my soapbox. But so I think that like being misseen is preventing progress, honestly, yeah. for and society. It, I, I wonder if it's also reinforcing, I can think of so many areas of life where, where this applies. Um, and mm-hmm. perhaps I wonder if it, I mean, 
my hypothesis is it it applies with or without neurodivergence too because you can mm -hmm. you know as a parent for example if your child is just different from you they're they're just different they have different mm -hmm. talents different preoccupations different interests let alone if you've got a child who's also neurodivergent or gifted or you know deeply profoundly different from you as the parent how important it is to be able to hold space and see the child you are you have versus the child that you wish you had and yes. i think as a parent willy-nilly we do have projections about and we might consciously like i did i tried to consciously not not project and and really welcome the child i was given but i'm also conscious that if i'm 100 percent honest that there would be some things in which my child or some ways she's just different from whatever image of a child i had in my brain so I think as a parent is such an interesting question and perhaps really important to 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 wonder, am I reacting to what I wish they were? Am I pushing them to be somebody or something that I think is important? Or am I really truly seeing them for who they are? Mm -hmm. And then in the context of work, working with so many leaders and talking about the challenges they've got, I wonder if as a leader, if we ask ourselves the question, have I pigeonholed this person? Have I Am I assuming that the way, you know, their lack of engagement is in fact about not being motivated or being lazy or being whatever other labels I might have put on them? Or could it be something else? Have we actually inquired? Have we leaned into a vulnerable conversation with this person to understand you know, this is what I'm perceiving, but what is it, ha what's happening for you that you're doing, whatever it is that's, um, you know, pushing my buttons. So, it, yeah. It's funny because I I um, spent a day most weeks doing leadership development down at the Tesla plant here in Austin. And I just spent my whole day talking about exactly what you're talking about, like the assumptions that we make. But like, if we get curious, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to be curious and judgmental at the same time, right? I love and that. assumptions are judges. They're judgments. They're, we're deciding something ahead of the, the evidence, you know? So what if you back that up and start asking as a coach what and how questions I was teaching folks today? Like, ask those questions. Those are the most interesting ones. And that helps you understand and come to new new ideas. And yeah, like it's a whole that's a whole different ballgame, right? It's a whole yeah. different ballgame. I, yeah, I'll but for say that again. Parents, the self-management is amazing. The the, the self-awareness and self-management to do what you're talking about is mm. I'm not a parent it like and it's hard enough for me as an aunt yeah you're an aunt aunts are very cool people I actually think I have a good friend who mm -hmm. is um he, she's the aunt of, of of all the kids in our friend circle including mine mm -hmm. uh, all adore her she doesn't have her her own kids but she says look I think Ants are the people who can really see without judging interestingly enough because it's like you've got you don't have that weight placed upon you yeah. of expectation that you might have yes. as a mom so sometimes there's generosity in being uh, <laughs> in being in that role it's true. in kids lives it's in true. a different way it's a good gig the ant role i highly recommend it, it for anybody who can get there yeah um, i was just thinking so can i go back to something about being seen so we were talking about i think it does apply to, to, to a lot of people in certain situations but i had three interesting data points one of which is anecdotal I had 24 participants and 22 of them like got what it meant, what I meant when, by being seen and could describe it and had all these, you know, these experiences, which was the data from which I pulled. And two of them did not. They just couldn't quite get their brains around like, what is this thing? They were also the two people who were in magnet schools growing up all the way and who never reported feeling out of place or out of sync their entire childhood. My mom is is like my touchstone for neuro neurotypicality. She's very bright. She's an incredible woman. Like I could go on for another podcast about her and she's neurotypical. She had, she really had to do some work and read my stuff to understand what I was talking about because she has no concept. And I have this idea that most people are seen all the time because the most people are like most other people. Right. So so they're getting that all the time. So they don't notice. It's not like the sun shining through the clouds because the sun's always out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so like when you say, like, how is this scene and not seen affecting? That's why I think the outlier pieces are are so important. And and also thanks, mom, for putting up with my dad and my sister and me, because twice exceptional Aww. folks are not easy. Who does to all the 
all the moms out there, <laughs> not only. Absolutely. Um, Neurotypical, neurodivergent, whatever. So I just wanted to throw that piece yeah. in as sort of a rounding out of, of that concept. Yeah, thank you. And I think this could be a really opening up or, or inviting a question for people listening to this, uh, whether neurotypical or uh, neurodivergent, what is their experience? What is your experience of mm -hmm. feeling seen in your life? And what is what is mm -hmm. it that you understand by that? Because uh, we haven't, I'm conscious we haven't actually defined what it means. Um, I'm curious if you do have a definition that has emerged from your research. What, yeah. What and it... so like when I was, when I was done, I realized I should have done grounded theory as my methodology to get a definition, except that my chair was going to be retiring. And she was like, no, nah, you don't need to do that. Do some thematic analysis and call it a day. So, okay. And now I know better. Um, so, you know, the definition that I use is being seen is when what someone reflects to you aligns with the way that you understand yourself. That's the yep. most succinct definition I, I can give of it. Yeah, beautiful. So where does the being, um, where does the piece around people seeing bright potential, the good in you that you might not yet see or acknowledge, where does that fit in, in that definition? It doesn't because being like, the scene is just the phenomenon, right? Yeah. Then what happens because of it is the effect. So mm -hmm. scene itself is is neutral. It's neither good nor bad, really, right? It's a phenomenon. Yep. Now, what are the what do people report as the effects of that? Is a different thing. So what do people report? Sense? Yes, it does absolutely. Okay. What do they report as the effects of feeling seen? Um, because you you did study how self concept shifts and we did talk about when you're unseen or misseen what the negative impacts of that are how does how can our sense of self or concept of self evolve as a result of being seen of finding those people in our lives who actually see us and creating perhaps those networks of i see you like <laughs> like an avatar I, I do love how they made that that phrase central to that movie um, yes but yeah, I'd love to know what 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 did you discover about that shift in self concept? So now I'm thinking back because I didn't actually study the shift. I really just wanted mm -hmm. like I got as far as studying the phenomenon and like okay. figuring out that it exists. It was like, is this a thing or is this just a thing I've made up about myself? Yeah. Um, right. So that was the first part. But as I'm thinking about my participants and what they reported, the ones who had experiences of being seen were more relaxed. They were calm. They knew who they were. They were able to be in life. They were also able to manage more. And maybe this is developmental. One participant described it as like being surrounded by like a round of sliding doors. And because she knew who she was, because she was seen by some people in different situations, she could calibrate which of those doors to open. How far do I open these doors in this situation and keep myself safe? right? Keep myself safe, be authentic. And that resonates with me a whole lot. So I heard that kind of thing from several people, the people who found places to be seen could sort of settle. I yeah. also had some participants who were still in terrible mental anguish from things that, you know, were high school and, mm -hmm. and still hadn't been resolved and still weren't moving up be because they hadn't had years an later. experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these were some of the people who, who they understood what I meant but they maybe had one experience or none. Like, you know, like me talking to them about it because I did um, short interviews, which were really just discussion to like align. And then we did short answer um, questionnaires. And in those discussions, they went anywhere from 10 minutes to I think 49 minutes. And the 49 minutes was this, this fellow who just fell apart talking to me. And I think he was being seen for one of the first times. Yeah. You know? So like, what's the shift I see the shift in my coaching clients now. I don't, I didn't do it in my research, but I see it now. Um, they settle, they settle mm -hmm. in themselves. Like, it's almost like, it's almost like when you sit in a comfy armchair and you relax into it, right? But you, but we've been sitting in this like hard back chairs and are very uncomfortable and our backs kinky. And you sit in this like oversized comfy armchair in front of a fire. Yeah. And that's how I you finally that's feel the, comfortable. Like, 
Yeah, that's how that I space. perceive them. Yeah. The, you know, and my clients near the end. I think it's such a, it resonates so much for me and, and thinking of my own experience, like in, in that small early example, being seen opened up. Yeah, it did give me some inner peace, but also opened up almost the courage to get myself out of my comfort zone. And yeah. in, in our own work in, in development and in developmental coaching, we talk a lot about holding spaces um mm -hmm. and and creating those safe spaces where people do feel seen and then from that space people seem to find the resources to take some risks that maybe they were avoiding before there's this almost polarity of safety and challenge if you want that where where this that safety coming i think in a large part from actually being seen and being mm -hmm. honored for who you are as a human being in your whole fullness, complexity, imperfection, all of those things almost opens up the possibility, those revolving doors that you are talking about. So I'm wondering for folks who are in context where they are holding space for other people's development, um, be it at home or be it at work, how can we potentially create that space? So what does it take? We've, we've spoken from the perspective of the person being seen or not being seen, what would you say it takes to see other people? What is there a way to hone this skill in a sense in yourself to be more of the seer? And I know you've dedicated your dissertation to the seers. That hasn't been lost on me. I think you said <laughs> to the seers who really matter, they matter these people in our lives, the people who do see mm -hmm. us. What does it take to be a seer? I think you started to answer that question a few minutes ago. Because when you were talking about being being a parent who doesn't put a, doesn't put projections, that wasn't your word, but on your daughter and being a leader who gets curious, right? Rather than assuming the disengagement is because they're lazy or because they don't care, right? So like, I think the first thing is the self-awareness of the biases we bring. And that is a never ending thing because we will always have biases because we are humans and that is what our brains do. So the constant, you know, self-reflection, self-creation, self you know, awareness coming to new levels and new levels of that, new levels up or digging down, it depends on which direction you'd like or, or diagonal for that matter. Um, so doing that and from there, being able to bracket your stuff, put it over to the side and that makes your lens clearer, right? What that does that mean? What does that flatter. mean, Tracy? To, how do you bracket your stuff? What would be an example of doing that? I, I feel like I want to ask you that. Um, we can, we can, um, yeah, brainstorm yeah. actually, but it's, it would be an interesting, well, like, yeah. You talked about doing it with your daughter basically, right? So how do you keep your expectations bracketed away? Yep. Like the expectations you came in with bracketed away from when you are actually interacting with your daughter and being with yep. your daughter, right? So it's this, mm -hmm. the awareness plus the self-management. Of yeah, putting it over it. here for a while. So it's on the one hand, kind of going. So what are the judgments I'm making? The assumptions I'm making here. That's Ooh. the self awareness part. What mm -hmm. are my expectations, fears, stuff that I'm turning into pressure that I'm putting on this other person? In my, in this case, my mm -hmm. kid, or it could be my team member, or whatever in that context. So that's how can I bracket those and and kind of acknowledge those are mine. I'm going to own them. Mm -hmm not project them onto this other person. So then I clear my view so I can see them yes. in a different way or in a more yes. open-ended way. Is that what yes. images? Yeah. Yeah. Like that, the more you do that, the flatter the mirror is that you're holding up for somebody else. And I mm. think curiosity plays in all of those places because the more you clear those away or the more you are curious about who you're seeing, right? Again, less judgment. So come in, this is the beginner's mindset. It gets thrown on all the time, but really like I'm a beginner with every single client. I know some trends. I know how things are, but like your daughter is a person who will never exist again, right? She sounds cool. She sounds fun. I want to hang out with her. And, and I have to go in making no assumptions about seven-year-olds or gifted kids or, you know, what I think about the couple things that you've said about her. Yep. There's also the part about getting curious about the stuff you bracketed off, right? That's part of the work is like, huh, 
I do have that thing coming up. What's that about? Let me go check into that. Which is some of the work we do as coaches, right? With people. Like, I hear this here. What's like, what's going on there? Yeah. Um, right. And doing that increases the awareness, allows for the management, allows for the bracketing, allows for a flatter mirror. It's a whole yeah, I love it. I, I almost feel like a process people could take and practice has just emerged from what you just said. Uh, I think you're, I think what we just said, what we just co-created, yeah. as you said, right? I think that's. I think that might be true. I think, but the place to start is with self. If you want to yeah. be a seer, you gotta you gotta know who you are, and therefore who to st- who to stand aside from, or what pieces yeah. to stand aside from. Yeah. Know who you are and stand aside from who you are so you can be a, a flat mirror well, that sounds for the other dissociative people. doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> no i think it's i think it's i uh, it, it is it's something in service that of exactly in the service of yeah i'm sorry go ahead no 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 i think i was just reflecting on the fact that this can actually be a worthwhile experiment to in, invite people in Um, Mm -hmm. maybe find a person that you suspect you might not be seeing or you're actively missing you're projecting a lot of stuff onto them maybe they're pissing you off or they're pushing your buttons or stuff is happening where Mm -hmm. you've labeled them already and then Mm -hmm. maybe make an inventory of the judgments you're making without beating yourself up just making a an honest inventory of them and then Mm -hmm. Bracket off some of the expectations, beliefs, assumptions, um, fears you've got mm-hmm. in relationship to this person, and then let curiosity emerge. Exactly. Two ways you said. On the one hand, curiosity towards this person. Now you've got space to be a bit curious about them. Do you actually mm-hmm. know them? Who are they? What are they feeling? What's important to them? What's their story? Um, and then curiosity towards all of the bracket itself that you put on the sides. What's Mm -hmm. that judgment there? Where is it coming from? What are you really afraid of? And so forth. And see what emerges from doing that. See what happens on both sides, right? Yeah, that curiosity. Assumptions are are often us filling in pieces of a story we don't know, right? Our brain gets a certain number of data points and it thinks it knows best. And it's those assumptions. And so when you take those assumptions out, it leaves the data points. And one of the questions that we ask in coaching is, so what's another story you could tell with those same data points, right? And by asking, getting curious about that, like some beautiful stories could merge, not just these, you know, nightmare tales that that you've come up with around the person or around the situation. So it's really, it's really, it's better for us too. Like, isn't, doesn't that sound like a nicer place to exist than angry and afraid and, you know, assuming and judging, right? Like, it's a lot less energy to be curious. Yeah. And more fun. You get to be surprised. Like I tell people that's the best part of my job is I get to be curious and surprised all day long. It's like awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think I love this so much because it's, and of course I'm subjective. We always love finding validations, <laughs> the stuff that we, <laughs> we, Absolutely. we care about. I mean, we all research ourselves, right? <laughs> But the the curiosity, um, and this is something I've touched on before, came as a central ingredient in my own exploration of leaders' lived experiences of vertical development. What is the inner experience that unlocks that vertical growth? And it did turn out to be the capacity to bring curiosity to the negative emotions that arise when we are disintegrating, when the disorienting dilemmas hit us. So I think that that is so aligned with the curiosity towards self and those nasty emotions you might be struggling with instead of pushing them down or projecting them as judgments onto other people, being curious about them, which now you f- I feel like you're adding one more element to that. This unlocks curiosity towards the other whom you might have been rejecting or you know, uh, pushing behind a wall because you just don't want to engage with this person because it just pushes off pushes all, so many of your buttons so it, there yeah, seems to be something magical about. there about curiosity i think there is something magical about curiosity i think it's fairy dust in a neuro in a, in a neurotransmitter like really it's amazing fairy dust in the neurotransmitter that's um uh, that's quote i don't know uh, but this this is insta quotable i've never <laughs> said that before but that's what came out just now but yeah and and what you're talking about also requires the subject object shift that we mentioned in passing right if you are in the anger, if you are in the judgment, it's really hard to 
to shift. But curiosity can help help you shift out of that, make that into object, so you can then be curious about it. Yeah. Right. You don't identify with the emotion anymore or the judgment anymore. Uh, you can. Yeah, you might still feel it. You can feel it, but also be curious at the same time. Huh. Look at that thing that's going on there for me. That's interesting. What's up with that? Oh, I'm having like when my ADHD like is flaring for whatever reason, I'll just go, oh, I'm going to have a bad neurotransmitter day. Okay. Need to give myself some grace. That's what's going to happen. And I'm still frustrated. And I'm still annoyed. And I still don't get enough done. And I, because I got curious about like, so why am I running into walls today? Oh, I'm exhausted and my interoception and proprioception are both off. Like yeah. bad neurotransmitter day. Right. So those are some of the like notice and be curious instead of just judging yourself or others do you feel that curiosity uh makes room for self-compassion and compassion more generally too oh absolutely absolutely because well certainly so it stays off judgment judgment doesn't really go with compassion or self-compassion right so it takes judgment out of the picture and it's those connections right for curious we're looking for things that we understand we're looking for things that align we're also noticing the diversity, right? Back to your research. We need both. Um, but, you know, curiosity is is seeking to understand. And what is self-compassion if not being understanding of oneself, like understanding what's going on and allowing the space for it, right? So, so yeah, what you just said makes total sense. It's, it's absolutely could be an integral piece to self-compassion. Now I got to go read some Kristen Neff and see if that's part of it. Mm. She's the self-compassion guru yeah. for people. So yeah, I think, oh, that's really interesting. I'm going to have to think about that. I think you're absolutely right. And I just got this like sense of peace thinking about it. So thank you. Very grateful for that. Oh, thank you. It, it hadn't occurred to me before this conversation, but I think one of the things that myself and most of the people I know really struggle with is this relentless judgment um everywhere in and out and quite often when you try to make the jump from judgment to compassion because there is a lot of conversation about compassion and self-compassion in organizational contexts nowadays people find it very very hard it's very very hard to even know what that feels like but i feel that almost what we're talking about here is that curiosity can be a bridge because yes we're all able to be curious. There's no human being who has not experienced the emotion of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and to be able to willingly access the emotion of curiosity might actually be the missing piece we need so we can cultivate more compassion for us. I and think others. that's I think that could be very right. And and curiosity is something. It comes naturally in some situations, but there are like these kinds of situations. You need to choose it. Yeah. Right. Which goes back to your developers and non-developers from your dissertation of like, they made the choice to look at be it. This way. They made the choice to be open to growth, even if it didn't feel like a choice. Because people tell that to me, oh, you made a great, you know, you made the courageous choice to be. I was like, what are you talking about? I got stuck in this thing and had to figure it out. But mm -hmm. like, but yes, that like you make the choice to be curious. Yeah, you have to be aware of it, or else the assumptions, the judgments, like that's our humanity. That that's normal. That's our. But when I go into a coaching session, I specifically like my my little coaching prep thing that I do in the few minutes before I start is, what are you going to be curious about? Mm -hmm. Right, and that just shifts everything else to the back, and allows me to have compassion for my clients, which in turn engenders self compassion for them. Yeah. But as a process, like as a step and a bridge, I love that. Mm. That's brilliant. And unlike unlike compassion, which maybe you can't willingly bring forth when you need it, mm -hmm. curiosity you can, because mm -hmm. there's a cognitive component to curiosity that I think makes it a very special emotion. It's not just it's not just in the heart; it's in the brain too. There's a it's a, almost like a cognitive it's emotion. Um, mm -hmm. So then there's there's choice, there's agency to choose to be curious about this thing that you're finding triggering or is triggering judgment. So then, then you make space to feel what you, yeah, feel feel a different feeling or compassion in this case. Mm. Well, and how empowering, right? If we like 
if we extrapolate from this and we work with it with our clients or we, you know, put it out in the world, like how empowering you have agency over your choice of curiosity, which means that empowers you to like drive compassion and self-compassion that empowers you to create your compassion and create your self-compassion. It's a choice, right? So that's both a like gift and a responsibility, but like what an empowering concept. I love this. I'm in awe at where we came with right. this conversation, Tracy, because we started before we kicked off the recording saying, okay, we've got a rough outline here, but let it flow, see what emerges. I had mm-hmm. no idea this was going to emerge, but I find it so inspiring and uplifting. And it's something that I, I have to think more about because it's it's a connection I have never, ever made before. And I'll be curious as people listen to this um, and maybe comment back or you know, mm-hmm. uh, talk to us about their thoughts. Yes. What, yeah, how, how, how people are taking this or how it's resonating, uh, this idea of choose curiosity. Um, and yeah, <laughs> as a pathway yes, to absolutely. self-compassion amongst other things. Like, I feel the synapses like firing and opening. <laughs> it's like the best feeling, right? It's funny because as we've been doing this, I've also been watching us do this, the, you know, these last 10 minutes or so. And thinking about how we came into this and how we come into each other, which is like, we see each other. We talked about that before we started, right? We haven't spent much time together, but like right away, right? We see each other. Yep. We're curious about what the other person's doing. Um, you know, I had nerves coming up because you're so brilliant in your field. And I like, I'm like a dilettante in vertical development. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then I put that down and I was like, that's not what we do. There's no reason to be like, and that's a judgment of myself. That's, you know, assumption about like, no, no, that's, that's not how we are together. Right. So like the other way around, we're being curious, we have compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I Is absolutely had no, I was gonna say I was absolutely had very similar thoughts. You you know so much about this universe of, of neurodiversity that I have no idea about. But it's not about that, as you said. It's about are you able to sit in curiosity and really welcome see the other person? And I definitely feel seen as well in oh. this dialogue. So it's just <laughs> I'm getting a bit emotional the best- here. Yes, that's like the most beautiful thing I've heard. And likewise, and I don't Mm. know about you, but I don't get it very often. I do because I've surrounded my, you know, made my life into it, but it's a rare thing to find a new seer. So I am grateful for you and I appreciate you. Likewise, Tracy. Um, And I'm really hoping, yeah, the seers out there (laughs) get a bit of, um, a bit of energy um, from this conversation uh, and maybe, um, left are left with the question of yeah who can I be a seer for or um who what seers do I need to look for if I feel like I need more seers um in my life and and maybe what we've talked about will create more seers that'd be pretty awesome that'd be awesome what's your highest hope I'll I'll leave you with this last question as we uh because I feel like we could just 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 a one-off you know dash that off what's your highest hope Right. What's your highest hope for this work? What what keeps you because you're so passionate about what you're doing? What I think is yeah, this little this love? little soapbox I dropped in the middle somewhere about like I I am this population, so I I have easy empathy for this population, and there's so much pain. There's just so much pain, and it's you know I'm actually a logical analytical thinker, even though I sound like an emotional thinker. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I can't make sense of it. Why this has to exist. And, and, and it's, like I said, it's holding us back as a society, as a world. And like, why would we do that? that that's so irrational. So like, my highest hope is we can free some of these interesting thinkers up to be contributing instead of ostracized. That's, it's only going to be better for everybody. Yeah. I can only second that intention. Uh, and I hope this conversation- Has anyone asked you a, that question, Elise? What's my highest Of your hope? guests? Yes. No, what's your highest actually hope not. For your work. Um, my highest hope is congruent 
um, not identical, but congruent with yours. Um, and I think it has to do with, I would love to see more grown-ups growing up into the wisdom and the maturity they have the potential to inhabit. Because I think that would allow us to make more choices, would allow us to create more conscious relationships, would allow us to create um, more happy um, workplaces where people can thrive and maybe ultimately a better, more sustainable world we might, you know. I think when we're wise, we're less destructive uh, as a species. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, and uh, yeah. Um, with wisdom That's maybe gorgeous. comes a reduction in suffering too I do believe that well wisdom is partially fed by curiosity right which increases compassion which uh -huh. is suffering love it how about that for a bow on the whole thing uh, that is uh, I love it's gorgeous <laughs> that's the perfect bumper sticker to finish this <laughs> conversation with Tracy <laughs> I'm deeply oh, grateful this for you. so delightful. I feel like I've just had a good stretch. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so, so much as well. And I know this was is not going to be our last conversation uh, to many more nerdy sessions no way. to come. But thank you for being yes, with please. me today. Thank you so much for inviting me. This has just been the, the highlight for me of my week. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation with Tracy as much as I have and I hope it has elicited for you at least as many light bulb moments as it has for me. I'll be very curious as you hopefully write in your comments on this episode what stood out for you, what questions you left it with, um, what insights you might have had. For me the Perhaps the most powerful idea in this conversation has been this um, core topic of research for Tracy, uh, the sense of being seen or not being seen and the impact it has on our long-term growth, whether we are neurodivergent or not. And I was deeply touched by what she shared around not even being able to find stories of people feeling seen. Because perhaps our instinct is when we look at each other and we see difference, we pull back. So I wonder if this conversation can be an invitation for all of us to lean in towards each other and particularly towards the diverse, the different other with curiosity, with a desire to see and allow ourselves to be seen. And just notice what emerges if we do that. What happens if we lean towards the unfamiliar rather than away from it. And also, if we look around us at the people that we work with or live with, who are those people whose brains just seem to function differently from the norm? What are the gifts that they can bring? Are we truly slowing down, stopping and harnessing these gifts, inviting them in to share them with the broader community, the broader team, the broader world? So lots of questions. These are just a few of my own reflections and I'm super keen to learn about yours. And I'll see you or hear you <laughs> in our May episode. Until then, stay wise and conscious and keep on asking good questions of yourselves and others. I'll see you soon.